All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening, and thank you so much for joining us for our Family Academy tonight. We are going to be covering anxiety, trauma, and pan a pandemic. Oh my, I tried to do that like lions, tigers, and bears. I know I did not do it well. <laughs> But this past year has been challenging for, I believe, everyone. And we've heard from a lot of families that, you know, there's an increased um, amount of anxiety out there. There's some social anxiety. My um, son, when he first went back to school, came home and was like, where's the hand sanitizer? And, you know, he was he really felt um, anxious about that day and that experience. So we wanted to make sure that we provided families with some strategies and some tools to hey, we're all working together in this. And so what can we do to make sure that we are taking care of our children? So um, we also wanna provide some tips from Bacon Street and they are going to, we're so happy that they have partnered with us. And so my name is Dr. Felicia Hyland and I am have the pleasure of introducing the executive director for Bacon Street. And then she is going to introduce our presenter for this evening. So Kim Dellinger has been with um, served as the executive director of Bacon Street since 2015. She is passionate about empowering um, youth and families to lead healthy and successful lives. Ms. Dellinger has worked um, in substance abuse prevention for over a decade. She lives right here in Williamsburg. She's a transplant like I am, but very connected to our community. So before I turn it over to her, I am actually just going to let you know that the chat is open for any type of questions that you would like to ask. Um, towards the end of the presentation, we will try to address as many of those questions as we possibly can, hopefully all of them, but depending on how many we get, um, we may have to um, give you some resources afterwards. But with that, I am going to turn it over to Ms. Dellinger and thank you all for being with us today to share your expertise. Thank you, Felicia. I appreciate your time so much. My name is Kim Dellinger. I'm the executive director, as she said, of Bacon Street Youth and Family Services. Um, we are a prevention and treatment facility um, here in the Williamsburg area. We've been here for 50 years. We're very excited that um, we're going to be celebrating our 50th anniversary coming up on May 11th. Um, Bacon Street has a long history in Williamsburg as being a supportive place for kids and their families to be able to, um, uh, to go when they're struggling with uh, a number of different crises. We provide prevention, treatment, um, and wraparound services for adolescents, young adults, and their families who are struggling with either mental health or substance use disorders. We do this in a variety of different ways. We partner with the school systems. We work with the uh, community at large. We um, do individual and group counseling and family counseling. Um, we have some really fun and inter interactive and engaging programs that um, our prevention team does um, in the community as well. So there's a lot of different kinds of ways that we support the partnership and the young people in our community. Um, I just, I, I want to say that I'm so thrilled to be able to have this opportunity to present, um, uh, I'm going to say present with um, Anna Marr. She is an LPC, which means she's a licensed professional counselor. She is certified in the state of Virginia and also in the state of Maryland. Um, she's an incredible, incredible um, uh, clinician, and we are thrilled to have her. Anna came to us um, about nine months, has it been nine months? It's something like that, nine months, uh, nine months ago. Um, and she has just been such a, a wealth of knowledge to the agency and we're thrilled to have her. Um, she's also loves taking uh, lots of time out of her, her, her busy schedule to be able to really um, share about these kinds of topics and, 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 and be thoughtful with our families and our young people, um, as well as their families as well. So um, Anna, I would just like to say thank you so much for being willing to present and talk about this today and welcome Anna. Thank you, thank you to Kim. Um, like Kim said, uh, I'm an LPC, which means I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Virginia. I'm also licensed in the state of Maryland. Um, just a little bit on what kind of gives me the right to even be here tonight um, and with the privilege of talking to all of you. 
Um, I started my career in social work, working with foster care and adoption, and then I went on to get my master's degree. Uh, and from there, I started working in residential and juvenile detention settings. So the concept of distress, trauma, and anxiety is something that I have seen in probably its most extreme forms. These days I work at Bacon Street as an outpatient therapist where I work primarily with a caseload of kiddos and their families who have experienced in some way, shape or form the effects of trauma. Um, and I, my goal is always to help children and families find healing in ways that work for them, not necessarily ways that are the you know textbook ways. So with that being said, um, I'd like to get into the presentation and just take a brief moment to acknowledge that um, it is an absolute honor to be engaging with parents. And parenting is a role that is by far the hardest role I think that there is out there, especially during the past year, um, year and a half. So uh, it is an, it's an honor and a privilege to be sharing this with you. And I hope this presentation will serve as a resource because you're probably already doing a great job and parenting, your parenting instincts are what my clinical brain can only describe your best tool, their magic, rely on those. Use this as maybe some education, hopefully some validation um, and some resources to just help that job maybe get a little bit easier. All right, we're gonna go right into this. There we go. Um, I wanna just briefly, go over what my plan is tonight to talk to everyone about. Um, I will warn you that the beginning is gonna be fairly educational and might seem a little overwhelming. So I will do my best to kind of go at a slow pace um, and reference back to some of the things. I will use somewhat scary brain terms, um, but just kind of go with it. I promise it, it should click. Um, so we're gonna talk about the word I've said at least three times already tonight, which is trauma. Um, and we're gonna talk about what trauma actually is. We're going to talk about this pandemic through a trauma-informed lens. We're gonna then move on to how does trauma impact our brain and our body? How are PTSD and anxiety similar? What about anxious thoughts? How is the nervous system connected to our breathing? Activities you can do with your kiddos or on your own for yourself and helpful tips and resources like promised, as well as a nice finisher with self-compassion. I try to say self-compassion and not self-care because that tends to scare everyone away. So please stay with me, I promise. I've done my best to make this presentation engaging. You're going to be invited to do some of these activities with along with me. Um, and there's some fun cartoons. I use sarcasm a lot. I work with teenagers. I kind of have to. Um, so I hope that you will find it uh, not just informative, but like a little bit fun since it's six o'clock on a Wednesday. All right. So I talk about trauma all the time. It is the crux of everything that I do in this work. So what is trauma? I want you to take a second. And when I say the word trauma, what is coming up in your mind? Just whatever's popping up for you. Think about it. Notice it. Is it a word? Is it an image? Is it a thing? That whatever came up for you is indicative of all the ways that you've seen and learned about trauma in the world thus far. Typically, we like to reserve the word trauma for big ticket items, things like abuse and severe violence or severe loss, um, going off to war. That is typically what we associate trauma with. What we are learning about today is that trauma is truly in the eye of the beholder. So yes, trauma could be getting into a horrific car accident. Trauma can also be picking out an outfit, going to school and being made fun of. It's the way that the brain responds to a perceived threat. That is a trauma response. All right, so this very scary and intimidating picture that I have on your screen right now, I'm gonna kind of explain that a little bit. We're gonna talk about three parts of the brain and how they work. The first one is that amygdala. The amygdala sits right at the bottom of your brain, and that's your emotional part of your brain. It's what's responsible for releasing that initial emotion, whether it's fear or sadness or happiness. You see something, your neurons immediately go, and that amygdala is going to initiate an emotional response. The hippocampus is what gives us good context. So it's using all the experiences you've ever had in your whole life to give context clues. 
That then corresponds to our prefrontal cortex, which is right here behind our forehead. And that is responsible for all of our executive functioning. It is what causes behavior, makes the decisions, has logical thought, all of that. So I like to use the analogy and it's not my analogy. This is from a training I went to for EMDR, which I will explain in a little bit. Um, you see a lion. Lions are scary things. They could eat us. They could threaten our safety, right? The amygdala is going to initiate a fear response. Danger. This is bad. Lions are bad. Initiate fear. The hippocampus is going to provide context. The hippocampus tells you, you're at the zoo, you're fine. You actually came to see this lion. There's a gate there, can't get you. You're not gonna die, you're good. Your prefrontal cortex, cortex takes a picture of the lion, posts it to Facebook. You, you know, look to your kids, look at the lion. You're calm, you're fine. Now, if you're walking down the street outside your house and there's a lion coming the other way, the amygdala is gonna initiate that fear response. It's going to be like, crap, there's a lion. We, this is bad, scary, danger, fear. Hippocampus is going to go, we are not at the zoo. The lion does not belong here. You could die. This is bad. Gives that context. The prefrontal cortex then initiates that fight or flight response. And in doing so, will cause the body to release a stress hormone. That hormone is called cortisol. And what that hormone will do will elevate your blood pressure, your heart rate, speed up your breathing. It's what causes that like rushed feeling of anxiety so that you can keep yourself alive and protect yourself from that threat. All right, don't leave. I promise it's not going to be this bad the whole way through. <laughs> All right, COVID-19 as a trauma. Why is the pandemic something that is considered traumatic? There's a lot of different ways we could go into this, but on a basic level, when we all were sent home from school and from our jobs about a year and a half ago, some of us actually thought this is a nice respite. Some of us were like, this is good, I needed a break. For some of us, it also threatened our livelihood, our jobs, our ability to meet basic needs. And then it, we started to get many, many messages at all times of the day. People wearing masks can send a message to that system that we just talked about that you're in danger, that someone has to protect their own body from you so that you don't get sick and die on a very like basic level. So as you can imagine, as adults, we have the ability, ability to kind of rationalize this a little bit. For our kids and our teenagers, that subconscious messaging that they get from the news, from witnessing people being scared or nervous in their households, all of that is setting off that trauma response. It's elevating the cortisol in their body. And what happens then is we have an excess of that cortisol and we have a lot of anxiety. How does trauma actually affect the developing brain? This kind of is self-explanatory, but it physically can change the way that the brain is made up. It can lower emotional control, lowers learning ability, lowering behavior control. All these things kind of happen in the brain because the brain thinks that if we are constantly under a threat and we constantly get those messages that our safety is in jeopardy, we don't have the luxury of acquiring new information. We don't have the luxury of being able to control our feelings or talk about our feelings or even acknowledge our feelings, right? So that is part of what's going on in our brain. You can see the cartoon here the dog is going to therapy and he says, I bark at everything, can't go wrong that way. I have a dog who does this constantly. Um, and this is kind of highlighting that hypervigilant type of state. So when the cortisol gets released over and over and the hippocampus starts to think, okay, I'm not really sure if we're in danger or not because we've never been through this before. We start to just go into that trauma response and it becomes it causes us to just be on edge and live in that heightened state of anxiety at all times. Now, this is a slightly busy slide. I apologize, but what does anxiety actually look like? It, and the answer to that is honestly, it could look like anything. And a lot of these things are both cognitive and very physical. You see the catastrophizing, right? That it's the end of the world. The, I am not going to acknowledge anything positive going on in my life. I'm sure all of you have had, not all of you, some of you have had this experience with your kids, right? We are only focusing on the negative, the isolating, the feeling disconnected from the world, having stomach aches, difficulty sleeping. This is all very similar to symptoms of PTSD. 
So if you've experienced a very severe trauma, if you have witnessed something scary or even just something that your body stored as traumatic, it's going to man, when you get triggered to remember that thing in any way, shape or form, it's going to look a little bit like what you see on the screen here too. I'd like to talk a little bit about what happens when it's not a lion, when it's not that external threat, right? What happens when it's our own thoughts that are that threat that's initiating some of that heightened cortisol level and, and trauma response? The quote here says, I'm not devaluing thoughts, just do not mix up what, what we think with what actually is. A lot of times I see clients who have intrusive thoughts things that pop into their head. And then what happens is that thought becomes their story. And then that story becomes their anxiety or their identity. So we want to not give power to some of the thoughts that come into our mind. I often do exercises with kiddos where I, I use the metaphor that if a man is in the middle of the street and he's screaming at you and you are We've all had that experience, right? Where someone is just yelling at us and we're trying to just ignore them and walk on by. But what happens if that man is yelling at you and he's like, you're not a good mom, you're not a good mom. And you walk up to him and you're like, wait, what do you mean I'm not a good mom? Did you know that I like didn't switch the laundry over this morning? Like, were you there? Did you know that somehow? All of a sudden we've engaged that man who was yelling at us in the street. We've engaged that thought, right? So we wanna not give that thought power. There is some ways that we can do that. Um, they, they all kind of involve tolerating the thought and acknowledging it without allowing it to kind of take over, but without pushing it away. Because if we just push that thought away or we try really hard to ignore it, sometimes it just gets louder. I'm gonna lead you into kind of the first little activity that we can do with some of those negative thoughts. The cartoon here says, prompter malfunction, you are on your own. Sometimes our brain is really good at sabotaging us and it just sends us the wrong messages or it's just not functioning well. So this activity, and I'll invite you to do it with me if you want to. If not, you can just kind of watch me with my eyes closed on the screen, totally up to you. Um, if you just close your eyes for a minute, I want you to just think of a negative thought. I'll use the example, I'm not good at math for that maybe one of our kiddos is having, right? And it's causing them to, I create this story, like then maybe they have a test coming up the next day and then they have the thought of like, but I'm not good at math. And all of a sudden it's like, well, I didn't do good on that one math test, you know, a week ago. So that's why I'm not good at math. And therefore I'm not going to do good in this test and see how this story starts to snowball and how it becomes part of our identity. We're gonna stop the story. We're just gonna take the negative thought we have about ourselves, and we're going to watch it go across our field of vision like a teleprompter and we're going to watch the words fall away on the other side. As the words pop up on the screen as they go across your field of vision, noticing what happens in our bodies is super important and letting those feelings go with the words. So join me, just kind of close your eyes for a minute and take that negative thought and just have it go across your field of vision. Look at the words and have them fall right off the screen. I would repeat this a few times until those words start to lose their identity or lose their grip on the kiddo and they just become words. All right, this is one of my absolute favorite activities. It is the cornerstone of EMDR therapy. I am a trained EMDR therapist. I will give you more information about that at the end as well. This requires some guided imagery and it's not just about visualization or meditation. What we're really trying to do is convince our brain that we're in control. So I want everyone, when I think of, when I say the word container, what do you think of? What, what pops into your mind? Just kind of hold that there for me for a minute. Now, I'd like everyone who is here in the audience, just kind of take a minute, just get into a comfortable position. Take a breath, close your eyes, or just shift your gaze over your nose, whatever feels comfortable. I want you to think of something mildly annoying that happened to you this week. Nothing super crazy, but enough that it's like stuck with you and it really, it, it bothered you. It had a negative impact on you. Maybe it was your kid. Maybe it was work. I don't know. Something that's popping up. And I want you to just think of that thing. Notice what's happening in your body. Where maybe are you holding some of that negative reaction? Where is that sitting? If you need to, go ahead and scan all the way from the top of your head 
slowly down to your feet. Just kind of notice anything that's going on physically as well as the thoughts and the feelings that you have about that negative thing. Great. You got the thing that made you kind of feel crappy? Awesome. Now I want you to go to your container. Look at the container. What does it feel like? How heavy is it? What color is it? Can you make that container as real as possible in your mind down to the very last detail? And I want you to imagine taking that negative thing that happened to you and placing it into the container. Imagine taking the negative part of wherever that negative is sitting in your body and also placing that into the container. If it's hard for you to physically place those things in your container, you can also imagine those things walking themselves into the container. Once all of that is inside the container, you're going to visualize yourself closing the container and sealing it. You have to be able to access it again, but when you are ready, you're in control of when you access that. Imagine yourself sealing up the container. It's safe, nothing can get out. You're going to put it on the shelf and you're going to imagine yourself walking away from it. Once you've done that, I invite you to bring yourself back into the room, just kind of open your eyes and just kind of check in with your body. See maybe if you've noticed any changes. This isn't a magic trick. It doesn't make all the bad things go away, but notice if anything is shifted for you. This is something that I use regularly, but kiddos can use it on their own. Really younger kiddos can actually make a container so that it's easier for them to have that representation when they need to pull it up in their mind. And that can be a really fun activity to do as well. Sometimes I prompt my older kiddos to kind of think of containers that are related to things that they're super interested in. They come up with lots of wild stuff. Um, but it is one of, it's one of my favorite activities. Okay, this is another one of those slightly overwhelming slides. I wanna to touch on two parts of the nervous system very quickly and how this nervous system is gonna be connected to breathing. The, when we have that trauma response, when we our, our prefrontal cortex is initiating that fight or flight response to a perceived threat or a danger, we activate the sympathetic nervous system, which is highly dysregulated. It's when we are experiencing a lot of distress. Our pupils expand, our breathing is shallow, our heart rate is elevated, and actually our immune system stops working. If you've noticed you've gotten more sick during COVID, it's probably because you've spent a little bit more time in the sympathetic nervous system than the parasympathetic, and that is very valid. Now, the parasympathetic is when we are regulated. It's when we're in a homeostatic state everything feels kind of normal. This is when we need to be practicing good coping skills, not when we're stressed out. The reason being is when we're in that parasympathetic state, we can really install good, good skills, good memories about what works in ways that we can access them quickly. When we're in the sympathetic state and, and we're in a trauma response, our brain is not storing things correctly. It's storing things in fragments and therefore it's hard to bring back up and hard to recall. So make sure when we're doing any of these activities, we're not just reserving them for when our kiddo is really upset and we're like, okay, I'm gonna teach you this new thing. Remember back to that first slide, their ability to acquire new learning when they're going through something that is causing them to be dysregulated is really limited. Okay, let's talk a little bit about breathing. The cartoon here, the doctor says, okay, go ahead and breathe in and out. And the guy's like, what other way is there? There's actually lots of different ways to breathe. Um, and breathing is one of our best tools into going from that uh, sympathetic to parasympathetic state. I had a parent say to me once, nicely, and I think with good intention, I feel like I pay you a lot of money for you to tell my kid to just breathe. Um, fair, very valid, um, but there's a lot more to breathing than just breathe in and out for me, right? We are trying to actually chemically change what's going on in the body so that we can get back to that regulated state. So, all right, we've got 14 participants here. I hope you guys are ready to do some breathing with me. I want you to go back and just kind of assume that comfortable position. Make sure your feet are on the floor for me. And I want you to just as comfortable as you can. We're gonna do some regulated breathing. And 
what we're going to do here is we're going to really stretch the little sacs that sit in your lungs that are responsible for like holding your air. I'm not really sure how that part works, but I know that it works. Um, we're going to stretch those sacs out so that we can go from that dysregulated state back into that more parasympathetic and regulated state. So we're going to breathe in for four and we're going to hold for five and we're going to exhale for six. We always exhale longer than we inhale. And we're going to do this three times. The reason that we do things in threes is because the first experience when we're trying something new, we learn it. The second time we do it, we're actively kind of applying it, that thing we learned. And then the third time is where we try and find the benefit. Sometimes it takes to like the 90th time to find benefit, but um, for the purpose of time in this presentation, we're gonna do each activity here in threes with the breathing. So I'm gonna invite you to breathe with me and I will do the counting, so don't worry. We're gonna breathe in for four, hold for five, Exhale for six. Good. Let's do that again. I'm gonna breathe in for four. Hold for five. Exhale for six. Excellent job. One more time for me. Breathe in for four. Hold for five. Exhale for six. As you were exhaling there on that last time, I hope it felt like you had to push a little bit of that last bit of air out. That's what's kind of activating you into that more regulated state. Kind of just check in about how you feel. There might not be a huge change and that's okay, but just kind of settling into what that breath did to your body, not just for the purpose of getting you oxygen. Did it alleviate some type of pain anywhere? Did it clear your head? Did you stop thinking about that thing you couldn't stop thinking about all day? Finding the benefit in those ways. Okay, another really awesome skill for anxiety specifically is grounding. The cartoon here says, it's a tree sitting at the desk and he's like, wouldn't you know, just when I'm starting to put down roots here, I get transferred to another department. And this is so representative of our year, right? Just when we think we're getting the hang of something, the ground get, gets ripped out from underneath of us. And kids especially are feeling like that now. You know, school is hard to get the hang of. Friends are hard. Social, social interactions are difficult. And then we get them ripped away from us. And we're like, how do I even, how do I even function now? So what grounding does is it reminds us to be in the present. Trauma will rip you back into the past. It wants to keep you rooted in a memory that makes you think you are in danger. And in order to get out of that state and out of that, you know, constant fight or flight, because we're dwelling on that bad thing that happened to us, we want to bring ourselves into the present moment and ground ourselves in what's going on now. So we can know that we are safe in the moment. This is also something that's very important to do when we are regulated and in a homeostatic state first so that we learn and it gets installed properly. All right, I got, I think this is my last activity, but I'm not gonna promise that because I'm actually not sure, but <laughs> I'm gonna invite you again to just kind of assume a comfortable stance. Close your eyes for me. And I want you to focus all of your attention on the bottom of your feet and feel the bottom of your feet connected with the ground or the carpet, the shoe beneath your foot, whatever it is. And I want you to just focus on that for a moment, the connection between you and the ground below you. Just notice if there's any thoughts coming in, allow them to be there, it's totally okay. We're not gonna give them any judgment, we're just gonna allow them to exist. Good, now bring your attention to something that you hear. Now bring your attention to something maybe you feel. Feel the air in the room around you. Is it cold? Is it hot? Are you outside? Is there a breeze? Now bring your attention to something maybe you smell. Bring attention to maybe the space that's inside of your mouth. 
Go back and bring your attention back to the bottom of your feet and the connection that you have to the ground. And take an inhale. And as you exhale, notice how much your body is pulling towards the ground and how connected you are. Nothing can knock you over. You are sturdy. You are like a tree that cannot be moved, rooted to the ground. Good, slowly bring your attention back into the room. It's important to do this kind of at your own pace so that it's not startling. Again, just noticing what's going on for you after that activity, just kind of taking note of it without judgment is super important. You can judge me all you want to, but your own thoughts, I'd like you to just allow to exist. Okay, I think we are done with the activities. Um, so, our first response when our kids are acting with some type of stress or anxiety, whatever it is, it's what's wrong because we want to fix it because we as Americans, as people, we want, we want solutions and we want end goals. And we are not super thrilled about the processing to get to that part. We just want the thing that will fix it. Right. A lot of times when we, especially with our teenagers say things like what's wrong, what's happening is we are implying that what they are doing is bad whatever emotional reaction that they're having, they can't have it because we need to fix it. And yes, we're not explicitly saying that and we're not bad people for wanting to fix it certainly, but it sends a bit of a message of shame and guilt for whatever they're going through. So I've got some maybe suggestions about other things that we can ask instead of what's wrong. What are thoughts you are having right now in your mind? right? Having them being able to verbalize some of those things that are coming into their head is huge and it's hard to do. So we want to encourage them to practice that. Do you feel in control of whatever it is? A big one for me is, do you feel in control of your body or are you sweating and you can't control that or breathing and you can't too fast and you can't get a hold of it? Do you feel in control of, you know, school? And if the answer is no, like, what can we do to help you feel more in control? Before I was a therapist, I like to tell this story. I worked in childcare. I was a nanny and a childcare provider all over the place. And a nanny for these two little boys and this dad would come drop him off. And he was probably about three. And we've, I think all parents have probably had this experience. You go to drop your kid off at daycare or at school and they are clinging to you for dear life. They do not want to get down. They do not want to go in. They are crying. Don't leave, don't leave. And you're doing everything you can. The dad was saying things like, you know, you love it here. You never even want to come home with me when I come to get you. It's nice out. You're going to get to go to the park. I'm going to be home before you know it and come pick you up. And he just wouldn't let go of his dad's neck. And he just was sobbing uncontrollably. Dad looked at me and he was like, got any ideas? And I said, yes, I do. I walked over and I looked at him in his eyes and to the little boy. And I said, how many seconds do you need before you're ready to come inside? And he said, I mean, seven seconds. And I said, would you like us to count with you to seven? And he said, yes. So together, me and dad and the little boy all counted to seven. I asked him then if he wanted to take a deep breath. Notice that I asked him if he wanted to. I didn't suggest it. And he said, yes. And together we took a deep breath in and an exhale. And then he jumped down from dad, took my hand and came in. When we feel like there's things out of our control that are threatening our well-being. And that doesn't necessarily just need to be a lion that could end our life. It could be threatening our social connectivity. COVID's done a very good job of that. It could be threatening our stability at home. It could be threatening our perceived abilities to succeed. Anything. We want to try and give our kiddos a sense of control. That does not mean you get to just hand over the reins and like what they say goes. Like you're the parent. Boundaries are good for sure but asking them, do you feel in control? What can we help you feel like you have control over? That can be really helpful in managing anxiety. Can you draw what's happening for you? You know what, big emotions are really, really hard to put into words for some kids and adults. So sometimes just a pen and a paper, can you draw what's happening? It can be really helpful. This is my favorite one. A lot of times, you know, it can be really confusing about what our kids need. Just asking them and giving them options, like multiple choice is helpful. But do you, do you want me here with you while you're upset? Do you need me to just hold this space with you and not say anything? Or do you actually want to talk? And if they don't know, 
you know, because they're in that dysregulated state where they can't really have good logical thought, maybe asking them, when is a good time to talk about how you're feeling? Can we contract to come back in 10 or 15 minutes and talk about this? Giving them that control about when they get to talk about their feelings again, right there. Contracting is something that I encourage with teenagers and their parents all the time. Right now, because it's hard to change our environments, sometimes kids don't want to come out of their room. I'm sure some of us have had that experience. They just will not come down from their room, right? If there's a perceived threat of, they're going to ask me about school if I go downstairs. They're going to ask me if I did Zoom. They're going to ask me what I learned in science class today. And that is truly, in our teenagers' minds, a threat. Um sometimes contracting to a school-free zone. So the living room can be a space where it is, it's neutral. We are not gonna ask you about school. So that, that teenager can come down and actively put himself in the living room to be with his family and know that, that he's not going to get those questions that he perceives to be a threat, right? Um, you know, setting boundaries for yourself too, like the car can be where you do talk about school so that then they know what to expect when those questions are coming. That type of thing helps to keep the nervous system regulated so they're not caught off guard and then, you know, the cortisol is released. And the last one sounds super weird, but also a, it's a super effective one. What are you noticing about your body? If your child or teenager is having a anxious reaction or any type of stressful reaction to something, what is going on with your body right now? Can we address that? Because we maybe we can't change what's going on in their mind. But if we can do the breathing, if we can do the grounding, maybe we can get control back over what's going on physically. All right. And this, this cartoon, mom is in therapy. And she says, actually, I, I just come here to lie down. I can't get any rest at home. Parents, your job is hard. It's so, so hard. And it's been made exponentially harder this year. You have to take care of yourself as well. You are a message of safety to your kids. And you know, I want to acknowledge that some of us have lost you know, our basic needs being met and that we're not feeling like we're in a very regulated state. And we need to, to address those things as well and, and get our own mental health uh, help. And if you feel so inclined, sometimes it's very easy to just kind of take your hand and put it over your heart and just kind of acknowledge that this is hard, that parenting in a pandemic is super hard work. I wish I could tell you, like, find the compassion for yourself and find self-love. I'm not even going to do that right now. I just want you to acknowledge that it's hard and validate it for yourself. And kind of just putting that hand over your heart finds that energy and centers it for you so that you feel like you have a little bit more control. All right. I did talk about a few things that I promised to elaborate on. So I want to just talk really quickly about some more resources. I am an EMDR therapist. That is something that is really focused on reprocessing traumatic memories. If you think that your child is experiencing a lot of the symptoms of PTSD or went through something specifically traumatic that talk therapy is not helped for or might not be helpful for, EMDR brings the body into therapy and allows for some neural reprocessing to happen. Um, it's highly effective. If you want to learn more, I very much recommend going to www.emdria.org. Um, there are a plethora of EMDR trained and certified clinicians in this area. Um, you know, we have, I am one here and I have lots of colleagues who are very skilled in this, who we could make referrals to. What is mindfulness? This is a great website to just talk about bringing yourself into the present moment and why that's so important. My favorite book that talks about all of this stuff is called The Body Keeps the Score. And it's on Amazon. I think it's like 10 bucks. I think there's an audible version too, if you're like me and you really don't have time to be like, you know, in a book um, anymore, or you just need kind of that distraction in the car. Um, I highly, highly recommend it. It's a wonderful explanation of how trauma manifests in a physical way. I'd also like to just touch on a few things. I barely scratched the surface this evening about trauma. If you have questions about your child self-harming or anything about suicidal ideation or anything that is a safety issue, I would encourage you to seek out a mental health professional. And if you believe that your child is an immediate threat to themselves, 
I would call the emergency hotline at Colonial Behavioral Health so that they can screen for um, an appropriate level of care to keep your child safe. So I just want to point, point that out that we did not go into more, the more complex and severe traumas, but there are ways that we can help with that as well. And you are not alone. Seek out a mental health professional, us at Bacon Street. There's a lot of great resources in the area. It has been an absolute privilege to present. I'm sure there are maybe some questions, maybe not, um, but if anyone has some, you can send in the Q&A. Um, please feel free to send any questions to uh, my email at Bacon Street. Um, I should have put that in there as well. <laughs> it's A, M as in Mary, A, H, R, at baconstreet.org. I am happy to provide more resources, education, or just general questions. And that is what I have. Thank you all for your time um, and for being here this evening. I'm sorry. Thank you, Ms. Mar. That was wonderful information. And I picked up some strategies that I can use myself. So <laughs> we appreciate you for sharing your expertise with us this evening. I am monitoring the chat. So if anyone has questions, feel free to drop them in the, the chat right now. And I'm seeing great information. Um, so yeah, they agree with me. Thank you, Mr. Willen. How are you? Um, and then also, were you able to put her, um, Ms. Myers' email address in the chat, Ms. Dellinger? I can do that right now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Email. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me uh, copy and paste these resources. Um, I might need to, there we go. I can put them in the chat real quick so that the links kind of pop up and we can give folks a second to copy and paste. Anna, do you want to take a, just a, a small moment to talk a, lo a little bit about some of uh, the groups that you're doing as well? Sure. Um, I'll talk about one in particular. Um, Bacon Street is offering a uh, equine therapy group for substance use specifically. Uh, this is for ages 13 to 18, male or female or any gender pronoun um, that presents with a substance use issue. And it is an awesome group. We just finished our first session. It's with Dreamcatchers Therapeutic Writing in Toano. And um, I'm sorry, I cannot do two things at once. Um, our second session is actually set to start this Monday. So if anyone has you know anyone that they know of any kiddos in your own house that are struggling with substance use the equine therapy has proven to be so much more effective than just talk therapy i said to someone the other day that like i don't know how these horses can get kids to do things that i can't get them to do and i have a master's degree but that's fine i will take i will take it <laughs> um and uh kiddos do not have to love horses. This is not necessarily like throwing them on horseback. It's really using horses as sentient beings and as mirrors um, for some of that emotional processing. I'm really sorry I lost the chat. I'm trying to copy and paste this into here. Okay, you there go we back go. to that screen, I can type them in. There we go, I found it. I think I'm in there. Okay. Uh, oop, I think I just... You sent it to the right place. You got it. I got it. Okay. Um, I think I just didn't include the number for the emergency hotline. So I'm going to send that now. There we go. All right. Thank you. And we actually did not receive any questions in the chat, but we will give people an opportunity prior to signing off um, time to write down the chat. I know it's difficult to cut. I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not able to cut and paste from the chat. So I would have to write it down or click on it from the chat. Um, so. All right. Okay, looks like um, we're all set. I am actually going to just thank everybody for joining us, the participants. We really appreciate you for being here and hearing this information. We will also post this uh, video on the division's YouTube channel. So if you would like to revisit it or see something that, I mean, you know, to look at it again or share it with a friend or family member, we would love that as well. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening.